So I'm going to go next then and we'll just give some um, brief alliance updates on uh, trials through the Lung Committee and Alliance. Um, so in terms of what's either open or um, still generating data from, um, number one on the list as it has been for the last 10 years is still Nasser al Torki's study. Even though it's close to accrual now, um, the uh, data is still maturing and I think we'll be a couple of years yet before we have an answer. And I'll just, I'll show the schema again on that one quickly and we'll, uh, we'll go through it. Um, the Alchemist study um, is still actively enrolling and we'll, we'll give some updates on that. And then two new studies that I, I think we talked a little bit about last year but are now um, basically live or about to be live. Uh, Roberto Benzo's pre-op rehab study and then Ivana Krogan's um, Varenicline versus uh, placebo study for smokers undergoing lung cancer surgery. We'll talk a bit about that one also. <clears throat> Um, so just to touch on the gaps first, um, you know, I think the whole locally advanced space as what Wayne was talking about here is really ripe for doing some interesting um, work. So you heard what's happening in SWOG. Linda's going to talk a little bit later today about what's happening um, through the Alliance and the Alliance Foundation. Um, I'm also excited to hear that, um, that, that at least some window of opportunity study in MISO is going to happen, uh, as Wayne just discussed in SWOG. It'd be, it'd be great if we had something that everybody could pile in on, but I understand the logistical issues of, of, of doing that outside just one cooperative group. Um, I, it looks like the um, NRG oligometastatic um, study is going to actually happen, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later uh, this morning. Um, still nothing in the multifocal lung adeno space, which I think is an, another place that's ripe for, for some trial development. Um, and we still don't really have anything as a su successor trial, uh, and maybe there shouldn't be, I don't know, but that's another issue for discussion for Nasser al torkis small nodule study. So just to remind everyone for, um, for Nasser's study, um, this was the original CLGB 140503 study um, looking at lobectomy versus limited resection for a sub uh, two centimeter peripherally located uh, nodule. Um, accrual is now complete on it. It was completed last year. So there are 692 patients on study now with uh, follow up um, actively taking place. I always marvel when I look at this uh, slide um, and, and the activation dates. I mean, this, was, this came live in 2007. So you can imagine the few year time period that it took even before that to go through concept review and everything. So, I mean, this is basically gonna be most of Nasser's whole career to get this thing done, which is sort of sobering, but it does answer a very important question. So to be continued, we'll be a couple of years yet before. Uh, there's some smaller studies starting to, to come out just on, uh, like for example, there's an AATS um, paper coming out uh, that'll, that'll be at the meeting. I, I, I didn't hear whether it's accepted yet or not, but um, on uh, just the 30 day outcomes in the trial. And there's gonna be a, a whole bunch of smaller studies like that come out before the real endpoint study comes out in a couple of years. Um, and there's a, a couple of imaging correlates also do you want to just talk about this briefly? Just, just to mention it, because you're, you're closer to it than I am. Right. Uh, so Ernie Scalzetti is the radiologist that uh, chaired the sub-study on the imaging that goes with this. So we're going to have this huge wealth of data of imaging on all the patients, including the ones who didn't actually get enrolled in the trial, and how we can correlate that with outcomes. Um, so I'm working on partnering with him. He's, he said he's not really in a place to write it up, so he's asked me to write it up, so I'm going to work on that. But I'm sure I could use some helpers if people are interested, and that's something that, again, I think we could probably get a few papers out of that. Yeah, if people are interested, this is definitely a place where, I mean, the trial's gone on so long that the people who originally wrote, you know, the, the sub-study part to it and so on have sort of lost steam on it. So um, there's going to be a mountain of data there um, for all the CTs and PET scans associated with the patients in this study where I think there's a lot of interesting imaging correlative work that can be done. So just let either Linda or I know if, if anyone's really interested in pursuing some ideas in that space. Um, in terms of Alchemist, um, this continues to chunk along. Um, if everyone recalls, the Alchemist is the, it's the umbrella screening trial um, that uh, is enrolling patients to then be able to do molecular analysis to be able to then feed patients into subsequent sub-studies. Um, 
so the uh, original uh, version of it had uh, just EGFR and um, ALK testing to feed into erlotinib and crizotinib sub-studies in the adjuvant setting. And then, of course, now there's the, the ANVIL study, the um, adjuvant nivolumab one also, and I'll show the schema for that. Um, in terms of eligibility, this is um, anything bigger than four centimeters, so a 1B and above. Um, and the criteria are pretty straightforward. As long as you fit within those stage categories, you just have to have a complete resection. You got to have enough tissue to be able to do molecular analysis. Um, and importantly, even if they've already had local testing done, so even if somebody tells you this patient already had EGFR testing or they already had ALK testing, the patient is still eligible for this study because one of the sub-studies is the correlations between the study-directed molecular testing and then what actually happens on the outside. Um, and then the two, the, um, the erlotinib adjuvant study and then the uh, crizotinib adjuvant study basically look like this. Um, so again, complete resection of a 1B to 3A, non-small cell lung cancer, molecular screening, and then patients are randomized once they've completed all of their therapy to either get drug or be observed for a two-year time frame. The observation piece um, has actually been changed from the original design of the study. So it originally was set up as a placebo control, but there was a lot of logistical issues and just delivering placebo and a lot of people not wanting to come for all their follow-up visits if they might actually be in the placebo arm of the trial. So they changed this to just observation only um, in order to try and maximize accrual. And then the um, adjuvant nivolumab study looks basically similar. Um, so, so the way this works in terms of screening is that if, uh, if you're a squame, um, they don't bother doing EGFR or ALK testing on it. If you're an adeno and then you're EGFR or ALK translocation negative, um, then you'll have your pdl one testing and then you're potentially eligible for the nivolumab arm of the study. So in terms of accrual, um, you know, if you look at the raw numbers, it's pretty impressive. I mean, 2,781 patients have already been enrolled to the screening study. So I, th I think this makes this the largest thoracic surgery involved study ever run through the cooperative groups um, by a couple of fold. Um, so the, the trial is very dependent on thoracic surgical involvement in order to get people involved and get them on study. The subsequent drug-related studies have not accrued quite as well as uh, NCI had initially hoped. So the, um, both the erlotinib and the crizotinib study are probably only capturing about half of the number of patients that actually have a molecular alteration. So the original projections by NCI were up in the 80, 90 percent range. They just assumed that they'd get everybody who had an alteration. But for whatever reason, only about half the people who actually have a specific alteration are really ending up uh, on study and being randomized. So the, the study continues to chunk along. The targets are in the couple hundred patient range for both of them. There's 166 on the erlotinib adjuvant study and, and just 57 on the crizotinib one, but it's still moving forward. As you can imagine, the nivolumab one is much easier to enroll to. So there's already 272 patients out of a plan 600 plus uh, on the study enrolled. And if you look at enrollment by month, it's pretty consistent. So the, the top line is the enrollment for the screening study. There's a couple blips, but on average, it's basically about 100 patients a month that are going on study. Um, so as I mentioned before, so how this basically works, uh, you know, if, if you're a squamous histology, you just get tested for pdl one status only. If, if you're non-squamous, then they do the EGFR and the ALK testing. Um, and only if you're negative will you actually go on and get pdl one testing and get assessed for enrollment into the nivolumab study. And then even for registered subjects not going on the sub-studies, there's planned follow-up every six months for five years. So the other interesting thing for all this data set, I mean, if we really end up with the plan 9,000 plus patients on this, um, we're going to have six-month follow-up data uh, up to five years for all of those patients. So this will be the largest modern lung cancer outcome cohort basically in existence. Um, some eligibility points. One of the things sometimes people get hung up on is how, how, long, how long can I wait and still put somebody on the study. So importantly, the, the patient can go through whatever their doctors think is their standard of care approach for adjuvant therapy. So 
you know, somebody, if, if um, the oncology team thinks it's critical that this patient get platinum-based adjuvant therapy, you can go through all of that and then still have an open window to be able to enroll the patient on study. So if someone's not getting any therapy at all after their surgery, you have 75 days. If they're getting adjuvant chemotherapy only, you have up to 225 days to still be able to put the patient on study. And if they're getting radiated too, you have almost a year before you, um, you have an open window. I mean, this is... Yeah, eye-openingly I long, but it's with the intent of trying to make sure that you're not missing anybody from a treatment fatigue standpoint. And it can't be recurrent non-small cell lung cancer. That question comes up all the time in uh, eligibility reviews for patients. Um, a couple reminders. So the the one of the big issues is just you do have to have access to tissue both for the central genotyping and for the research genomic piece that's going to happen from all of this. Um, so th there's uh, a total of eight five micron sections that are required and if you don't have the blocks that do that, um, it's in the protocol in terms of how you can actually generate scrolls um, to do this. And this is certainly something you'd have to work closely with your pathology team in order to be able to sort that out. If anyone has that as a hiccup at their institution, just let me know and we can, we can try and follow up on that and figure out where the, uh, the issues are. And again, importantly, even if you've had local testing, that doesn't negate someone being on study. So even if they've had local testing that says that they're uh, negative for an EGFR mutation or an ALK translocation, they're still eligible because it's the centrally based genotyping that will determine um, how someone's actually allocated from the umbrella study. And why don't we stop there to break it up?